Hey there, welcome to the Couch GM and the Couch GM podcast. Uh, today we're going to be doing it live, and I'm excited because we're going to be having uh, Ryan Divish of the Seattle Times. He's the Seattle Times Mariners beat writer. He's going to join us around 8.30 tonight. We're going to be talking all things MLB trade deadline, all things Mariners trade deadline. If you're joining me live on YouTube, Twitch, uh, Facebook, Twitter, wherever you are, Make sure to comment below your questions that you have for Ryan, for myself, any uh, comments, opinions that you have on the trade deadline. Did the Mariners do enough? Did they not do enough? I know there's a lot of opinions on the Paul Seawall trade in, in particular, potentially some trades that didn't happen that you guys might have opinions on. So share that below. But if you watch today's series finale against the Red Sox, it was a good one. Yes, this is live, AJ. Uh, the, the series finale against the Red Sox today was a good one. Um, they ended up winning 6-3. It started off with a rally in the bottom of the sixth inning. Cal Raleigh hit a two-run home run. Um, bottom of the sixth inning, and then they went on to tack on an additional four runs in the seventh inning. And that inning in specific was interesting because it started off with uh, one of the new guys, Dominic Canzone, with the leadoff walk. And if you look at Canzone's minor league s statistics for this year, um, over 304 plate appearances in AAA this year before being traded or b before being called up by Arizona and then before being traded over. Uh, 304 plate appearances. He had a 354 batting average, an on base percentage of 431, and an OPS of 1.065. He had a walk to strikeout ratio of right at one. So he was walking pretty much for every time that he was striking out 39 walks to 40 strikeouts. Anyways, he started the ending by walking and then eventually Cade Marlowe would come in as a pinch hitter. Cade Marlowe uh, was called up about two weeks ago. He's an outfielder rookie for the Mariners. He came in clutch against a lefty lefty on lefty hit a single up the middle and scored uh, uh can zone to start that rally. So, I think you'll be seeing a lot of that and the Canzone, the Marlows, Rojas. I think they will be a good addition. Now with the win against the Red Sox today, there aren't really any other games going on that would affect the standings for the AL. So here's the current standings for the AL wildcard. Right now you have Baltimore in lead or in first place in the AL East. You've got Texas Rangers in the first place in the AL West. You got the Minnesota Twins first place in the AL Central. You got the Tampa Bay Rays. The Tampa Bay Rays with the first overall wild card spot. They are currently five games above the Toronto Blue Jays, who hold the last spot. You got the Rays, the Astros, and the Blue Jays with those three AL wild card spots currently. Then you have the Boston Red Sox, who are two and a half games back of the Blue Jays. You've got the Yankees that are three and a half games back. Also, the Mariners are three and a half games back. And then with the Angels losing today, they're now behind the, the Mariners. They're four games back of the Blue Jays. And after today, it's a big series coming up. There's four games in Anaheim against the Angels. So that will really swing things. You know, if the Mariners can take three games in that series, then they'll spread the difference between them and the Angels in that wild card. Also, um, let's see here. Let's take a look at Toronto's schedule. Okay, so the the Blue Jays head to Fenway to play the Red Sox for three games. So that's another important series that you'll want to watch is the uh, Blue Jays versus the Red Sox. Three games there. That'll that'll that could also swing things pretty good. Now, getting into the MLB trade deadline a little bit before Ryan gets on. There weren't really a ton of big names, specifically bats, that were moved. Um, one of the, the bigger trades, you know, you got the Rangers going after Aroldis Chapman a few weeks ago. But then closer to the deadline on July 26, the Angels get Lucas Giolito and Reynaldo Lopez from the White Sox. Um, they also ended up getting CJ Krohn and R Randall Grichik from the Rockies. Those are a couple bats that might have been able to help. And then um, aside from that, the Rangers got, you know, of course, Max Scherzer from the Mets, Verlander to the to the Astros. 
but there wasn't a ton of bats that were moved. Also, the Rangers got uh, Jordan Montgomery um, from the Cardinals. Now, let's see. We got some questions here. So Ryan's thoughts on why the Mariners seemingly cannot develop MLB hitters. I'll ask him about that, the, the development. And we'll, we'll see what the... We'll see moving forward how their hitting development is. Because, I mean, you got Harry Ford's been a stud. Cole Young's been a stud. Then you got the the three first-round high schoolers in the draft this year. So we'll see how quickly they rise up the ranks and how they perform. Uh, but, yeah, pitching, p- pitching has been the Mariners' MO for the most part. Uh, as far as the minor leagues are concerned, pretty much their entire rotation at this point is – you know, draft and developed uh, talent for the Mariners. But so as for the Mariners, uh, they had acquired Trent Trent Thornton from the Blue Jays. He was DFA'd. Um, they acquired him on July 26th. He's a reliever. He's He, he has some quality stuff um, when he's on his game. And as we saw with Paul Sewold, uh, you know, he wasn't finding success in New York on the Mets. You get a guy like Trent Thornton that comes over. If you watch his stuff, he's got some great movement to it. Uh, I I spoke with him today, actually asked a few questions. I'll post that video tomorrow, but he said that his arsenal, he's always been able to spin the ball really well. So his curveball has a high spin rate. His sweeping slider has a high spin rate, um, have a ton of movement to it. He also throws a sinker four seam. And I think he said a hard slider on top of that sweeper. So you get a guy like Trent Thornton, you know, we lose Paul Sewald in that closer spot, you could say the Mariners technically don't have a closer. They tend to pitch to situations rather than having set roles, but you get a guy like Trent Thornton. Um, you, you, you have Munoz Munoz for those highest leverage situations where he's going against the best guys in the opponent's lineup. Um, you got Thornton, you got Brash, um, you got Topa, you got Gabe Spire has been really good. Um, Saucedo. Yeah. And then you currently have Devin sweet up here. You have Isaiah Campbell. We'll see if, you know, they, they go to prelander Baroa again, or some other guys from the minor leagues to help fill in some of that bullpen depth. And, but the return that they got for Paul Sewald, I think was pretty substantial when you look at it, especially, you know, Paul, Paul Sewald has been great for us, but one and a half years of a reliever essentially and you get a uh, current major leaguer, Josh Rojas. He's been in the league for going on three, four years. Actually, this is his fifth year in the, in the major leagues. In the prior couple of years, Josh Rojas was a, right around a league average bat, a little above. This year, he's having a bit of a down year. On top of Josh Rojas, you get um, Dominic Canzone, who... You know, as they said, w- when he was called up to the Diamondbacks, he was batting in the in the middle of the Diamondback Diamondbacks lineup this year. The Diamondbacks have a better have a better record than the Mariners, and he was batting in the middle of their lineup. So the fact that you know we're able to plug him into ours, I already went through his minor league numbers. You should go look him up for yourself and dive into it. But he's been able to hit and get on base wherever he's played. So that's that's key. And if you can plug a guy like that in. The Mariners DFA Colton Wong. Um, they get rid of AJ Pollock. You plug in Canzone, Rojas. Um, that's, I mean, uh, that's a big plus right there just with those moves. Do I think Josh Rojas will turn his se- season around? I hope so. I definitely think so. When you look at his stats, they show that he should be hitting better than he currently is this year, just like pretty much the Mariners' entire lineup. You know, their entire career, they've been hitting better than they have this year. Um, we saw Teoscar Hernandez heat up. He had a really slow start to the year. We'll see if Julio, we'll see if Julio uh, goes, gets back to where he was last year. I mean, he very well should. He has the potential to, to change the, the team on his own. Um, but Josh Rojas, yeah, he's batting 223 right now. Um, Josh Rojas doesn't have any home runs. I saw a stat the other day to where he's like fourth or fifth out of the most played appearances in the league this year without a home run. So I imagine we start to see some more production out of Josh Rojas for sure. Thoughts on getting a Canzo, uh, Canzone jersey. 
I think that's a pretty safe bet. Um, I mean, he's going to be with the team likely for around six years. So that jersey should last a while. We'll see if he lives up to, you know, his potential. He looks like he very well could be a stud. But um, at, at the very least, it's a fun last name on a jersey. I'm going to start some of these comments that you guys put. If you have questions for Ryan, and I'll make sure to get back to them. If Ryan was king of the world and running the M's, what would he have done this year and why? I'll make sure to ask that. Yeah, as Thomas says, a closer doesn't matter if all your guys are good. That's definitely true. And more so, it, it's that you know Scott uses the bullpen differently than the typical closer because... And, and it makes sense to do it the way that he does it is sometimes the, the, the most crucial situation of the game is not the ninth inning. Sometimes it's the seventh inning to when the heart of the lineup comes up and they could potentially change the game right there. You don't want your seventh inning guy. You could say that's not as good as a Munoz uh, or that, that kind of caliber you, you bring in Munoz at that point against the best guys, shut them down. And then you could have who else fill in after that. And then typically Paul Sewell was getting the closes because Munoz is probably already used. But I mean, the Mariners bullpen and pitching staff as a whole, if you look at fan graphs, wins above replacement, you know, they've been one of the top pitching staffs in all of baseball. I think right now they're third total. And so that's the, bull the bullpen and the starting rotation are both some of the tops in the league. Yeah. So from uh, requiets, it's hard to tell sometimes whether Jerry or Justin are genuine or are spinning something in interviews. Any thoughts on their post deadline interviews yesterday? I listened to it one time. Um, I listened to each of theirs one time. I mean, it's it's a kind of a hard situation to be put in, you know. When because let's be honest, on opening day, I was excited for the Colton Wong trade. Um, I wasn't excited for AJ Pollock, but the acquisition of Colton Wong, especially when it's, you know, Jesse Winker and Abraham Toro, you're not giving up much. And Colton Wong was coming off of a career offensive year. He had a down year last year as far as defense, but it was, he was a back-to-back -back gold glover a few years before that with the Cardinals. So Justin said, you know, that he didn't do a good job this off season, you know, in bringing in, Colton Wong and Pollock and Tommy LaStella, these guys. And, you know, he, he says that he didn't rely on, he wasn't relying on them to be like, you know, an all-star player or an above average player just coming in and play at their career norms. And so, and they also said that they aren't, you know, strapped down by ownership as far as how much they can spend. And, you know, you can only, you know, you have to take it with a grain of salt. I mean, of course, anything that they're doing that's public facing, they're not going to say exactly what's going on behind the scenes. And I'm just curious, you know, what other trade talks they had going on up to the deadline, because there was rumors that, you know, they were shopping Teo, they were shopping Ty France, even they were shopping or in conversations, listening to offers, at least for young, starting young, controllable pitching. So that's Logan Gilbert probably Bryce Miller, Brian Wu, at least listening to offers. So I'm curious what else was out there on the table. Now, if you did trade one of those young starting pitchers, that makes things a whole lot different as far as, you know, the rest of the year. So I'm personally glad that they, that they did not trade one of those young guys because that has ramifications for years to come. And it's not worth it to give up one of those guys for, unless it was, incredible impact with a bat and young, young impact. It wouldn't be worth it, but, um, but I, I really enjoy the transparency that they have in, in the Mariners organization in specific. I'm not sure if other organizations do it also. Um, but they, they're always on, you know, public facing type interview things like Jerry DePoto on the Mike Salk show every Thursday. I really appreciate just being able to hear what he's saying, even if I don't, believe everything that they're saying or if you know at least he's there answering the questions not shying away from it so that's a plus to it um and so tomorrow's thursday so jerry depoto is going to be on the mike salk show on seattle sports 710 so make sure you know on spotify wherever you i think that they're on youtube also 
look up the Mike Salk show, Seattle Sports 710, and Jerry Depoto will be talking about the trade deadline tomorrow. One thing that is frustrating is that they always say, you know, well, the market wasn't doing too much, or um, we just weren't able to get enough done or as much done as we thought we would type thing, and, or the talks didn't go anywhere. So I'm just curious, you know, what other talks they had and who else they were pursuing because they very well could have added more impact with bats, but with the, you know, the bang for the buck that they got with Paul Seawald with these two major leaguers now, plus the Ryan bliss in who I've heard is a stud. He's now on the Tacoma Rainiers. He just got promoted from double a sounds like there's some real potential there with him being a second baseman moving forward for us. So Yeah, we should definitely split the series at least in Anaheim, if not win it. That's going to be a really important series. And uh, tomorrow it's going to be, be Brian Wu against Shohei Otani. So that'll be quite the matchup for the first uh, game of that series. And Casey Sadler should be back soon, which will yeah have a big help at the back end of the bullpen. And so we'll see if Isaiah Campbell or Devin Sweet are one of the guys that will be sent back down once Casey, Casey Sadler comes back up. If the Mariners don't make the playoffs, do they fire service? Um, I don't think so. I don't think it's, I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, put their opinion out there that, Oh, fire Scott. It's, I, I don't think it's the managing of the games, to be honest. Um, you might be able to argue that in certain situations with bullpen usage, but I personally don't think that it's the management. It's more so these are good players on this team and it's a, it's a solid lineup. <laughs> Some of it comes down to the players just not performing in spots to, to where they should be performing. It's not all you can only, you know, find the scapegoat on the coach so much. Do I think the moves are addressing the bad strikeout rate? I think it's addressing, yeah, the bad on base percentage, you could say, um, the, the bad OPS, you could say the on base plus slugging. So, I mean, Dominic Canzone, as I've mentioned, triple a this year, he's on base at a 431 clip OPS of 1.065, which is insane. Batting average at 354. He's walking a ton. So Canzone at the very least, if not Rojas, let me take a look at Rojas. Canzone's a guy that's going to get on base. He's going to draw his walks. He's going to make contact. And he also has some decent power numbers. Um, through 304 plate appearances, he had 16 home runs, 71 RBIs. And to go along, he only had two stolen bases. But so, yeah, Canzone, I think, is definitely going to help the strikeout rate and the on base percentage, the OPS. We'll see if the rest of the guys. Uh, pick it up. Brian said, did I hear that one of the guys coming over from Arizona was a position player slash reliever? Well, on uh, Brian, uh, sorry, Ryan Bliss. On Ryan Bliss's uh, stat page, it has him listed as second base slash shortstop slash relief pitcher. He might have just, you know, pitched in a blowout game one time and they decided to add reliever to him also. Let me take a look at, I don't think he has any serious innings or anything. Yeah, Ryan Bliss, he's 5'6", 165, you know, in the video that I made the other day talking about the trade, I referenced Altuve. That's mainly just because of the size. Um, well, if he can have production like Altuve without having an Astros logo on his hat, then that'd be amazing. Um, let's see here, registered pitching. Okay, so it shows Ryan Bliss, it shows 18 games pitched in at Auburn, but it doesn't show any stats. So that, that's probably just a typo type thing. And that's just in college, but no, he's not a, uh, an Otani Ryan should be jumping on sometime soon. As you probably are aware, he's very busy writing his, uh, articles and stuff, but we'll see here thoughts on Ty France's year and his future with the M's. Well, it was interesting. I didn't expect them to be shopping him. Um, but I'm curious to hear, you know, from Ryan on some of these rumors and insider 
things that he's hearing um, on what's going on. But yeah, let's look at Ty France. So Ty France this year has a 255 batting average, 325 on base percentage, 698 OPS. His OPS plus, so that means, you know, compared to league average, is at a 97. So he's just below league average. Um, the last three years, though, I mean, he was more than 20% better than league average. So he's striking out quite a bit, which is the biggest problem, it looks like. You know, he's another 10 strikeouts, and he's going to be matching his strikeout total from last year. But, I mean, I think he has two and a half years left of control, and he plays great first base. I don't see him going anywhere. I mean, especially with, you know, the two and a half years of control. He was an all-star last year. I, I think he'll bounce back and hopefully in the second half he produces. But um if at the very least he might be moved down in the order for the rest of the year, we'll see. One of the questions, ask Ryan if you ever got Goldie for that time Goldie got him on TV with his glasses. Or when he was eating ice cream on air when they were doing that ad for the Seattle Times. I'll ask him that question. <laughs> Do you think Seawald would have had as many saves if Munoz didn't get injured? Um, well, so I'll ask you, try try and guess how many saves Andres Munoz has in has in his career. Might surprise you. Andres Munoz in, in his four years in the major leagues three years now with, with the Mariners. He's pitched 91 games for the Mariners, Andres Munoz. Guess how many saves he has. In 91 games pitched, he has six saves. So Munoz has never been used in that ninth inning, the save really. Service has used him pretty much entirely since we've had him <clears throat> as that high leverage guy against the best of the order, which typically as we've seen, doesn't come in the ninth inning. He has, let me see here. He has a ton of holds though. I'm trying to find the holds. But to answer your question, um, I think Seawald would still be getting the saves. You might see Brash with some of those saves, but I think Seawald was, was kind of playing for that guy. Munoz is, is the high leverage guy, and then Seawald you know, wraps it up in the ninth. So Munoz has 22 holds in 2022, 12 holds this year so far. So just between these past two years, he has 34 holds. And over his time with the Mariners, he has just six saves. So he's that he's that holds guy. And then Accent says, the one question regarding payroll that they were asked, it seemed like the, that answer was forced. Didn't seem genuine, said that they are financially capable or something along those lines. Yeah, I'll bring that up to Ryan also. Here we go. We'll add in Ryan to the stream. Ryan, how's it going? Pretty good. Can you hear me? You what? Uh, yeah. You uh, just leaving the stadium? Uh, no, I uh, kind of had to hang out with some uh, Larry Stone and some guys for a little bit. So I uh, got out of there a little earlier than I thought, but we went and had some dinner. So awesome. checking out now. Yeah, well, I appreciate your time, and thanks for jumping on. Not a problem. So, yeah, big big win today against the Red Sox, big series win against the Red Sox. Um, as of today, they are now, uh, let's see here, three and a half games out of the wild card, and uh, big series coming up in Anaheim. So I guess first off, your initial thoughts on, on the series and the game today. Um, Yeah, I, I thought they played pretty well for the most part. I mean, even the game yesterday, they had their opportunities to win. They pushed Bryce Miller a little longer than maybe even they wanted to, but that's just because their bullpen was kind of banged up a little bit or not banged up, but just used a lot. So they didn't have a lot of guys available. Um, so in that regard, yeah, I thought pretty good series. I mean, like it's crazy. If you look at the last road trip, you look at this series, they could have won every game. I mean, like they went, you know, they won every series and won two of three in every series, but they, they ostensibly could have won the three games they lost. They were right there. They've been very competitive. Um, over these last, actually really since July. I mean, the, the Tiger series was a stinker, but the rest of them, they've been pretty good. And, um, you know, if this is the, <laughs> this is the level they kind of needed to play at in May and June. And, you know, we'd be talking about different things probably. Yeah. 
absolutely. They're uh, definitely hot right now. And I saw Larry Stone actually, you know, tweeted uh, shortly after the game that one thing to keep in mind is that the Mariners have a stretch coming up where they play the Royals, the White Sox, A's, the Mets, 16 out of 19 games in August and early into early September. So that's another stretch to where the Mariners really could, you know, jump up in that wild card rankings. Yeah, I mean, like I look at it. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's a nice little stretch. But I mean, I just remember last year where we thought, you know, they're gonna clinch this stuff early last year because they had such an easy stretch, and you know, some guys got dinged up, and their pitching wasn't very good, and they were losing games to Oakland. They were losing games. Remember, they lost that crazy game in Kansas City where they were up like six or seven and they lost. So, I mean, like it's hard to win one baseball game um, at the big league level, and you know, if you don't play well and the Mariners, given their talent, um, they're not like they don't have separating talent from from the, the bottom part of the league. So if they don't play well, they're not going to win. And so, yeah, it's is it better? Yeah, probably that they're playing these teams with losing records. But if if they just think they can kind of go through the motions and win games, that's right. Like a- yeah. So let, let's get into the trade deadline. Okay. Um, initially, what are you, what are your thoughts on what the Mariners did or did not do? Um, they kind of did what I was expecting them to do. I mean, I knew they were going to trade Paul Seawall. I just that's just a very it's a very Depoto move, but it's a very just modern GM move. It's a closer type reliever that's older. It's going to get more expensive the next year and the year after that and probably pitching at the highest level that's when you capitalize you know you don't make you usually don't get a ton of value from closers in the offseason so i figured that was a move they made and partially because paul seawald is why they can trade him like they made i wouldn't say they made him they helped make him you know he did the work himself in terms of believing in what they said but like they taught him or they they offered the information about what he could be if he did certain things he embraced it kept with it even when it wasn't working right away and he became this guy well i mean like if you're the mariners and you've had success with paul seawald and if you think about the 2021 year they go get jt shark off a minor league sign i think and drew steckenrider and those guys those guys were valuable and you look at this year justin topa gabe spire taylor salcedo you know those are it's found money, I think is what I wrote. It's found money, and they've made them into something. They've helped make them into something. So that's why they believe they could, you know, they could move on from Seawald when he's getting expensive and just find somebody else to do it. And, you know, and they have some young arms in the organization. It's a very Tampa Bay Rays type of deal. You know, we kind of joked about it, but when the Rays traded Diego Castillo to the Mariners, a lot of people in Tampa thought, oh, why are they doing this? And a lot of people... And the Mariners like, oh, man, we're getting a steal. But what the Rays knew is that Diego wasn't in great shape. He was starting to lose some of his effectiveness with his command. And he was getting expensive. So they made the trade. And that's kind of what Paul, with Paul, like, I just feel like they didn't, there were, his value was never going to be any higher to them or on the open market than it was right now when they moved on from him. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I- I think getting three players, especially for, you know, one and a half years of a reliever, if you look at it from a objective standpoint, I think that's pretty solid with what they got. They got technically two big leaguers, one guy that's, you know, going on his fifth year. And then with Canzone, a guy that was crushing triple a, um, super high batting average on base percentage. And now he was, he was batting in the middle of the diamondbacks lineup. Who's, you know, fighting for their division. And now he comes over to the Mariners in the, in that deal. Um, what do you see in Josh Rojas in Canzone? Um, I, I see players that can help. I mean, like, I think what you hope with Canzone is that, like, he's he's a guy, I mean, obviously not maybe Mitch Hanniger, but, like, a guy that's kind of got that that similar build and profile that can help you. Um, you know, maybe he's not an all-star, but he's a, he's a quality big leaguer, and, you know, like, he can help you play. Um, they, they've lacked that. I mean, like, think about some of the left fielders and right fielders they've ran out there in the past years. Hell, they, they run out, they run out utility infielders for so much of this last few years. Like Ken zone can, you know, he's a 
decent defensive player and he, he has a pretty good approach. I mean, it was still better than what you have, especially with Jared being hurt. Rojas, you know, he had a decent war last year. He's kind of ran into the skids this year, but, you know, he's a good athlete. I mean, like, it's still, in a way, it's a better – you got younger at those positions and you put some guys out there that maybe can help you. You know, again, like I said, Paul can only help you in certain situations. These guys can help you on a daily basis. And so, yeah, I, it they're great. I mean, I guess if you – if they, they could have shot Paul for, like, the one guy, but even, like, Kittle Graveman got Corey Lee – the catcher from the the Astros is kind of their top catching prospect. But I mean, like, I don't believe he was like a top 100 guy either. So it's like, you know, you're, yeah, the value is as high as it ever will be, but it's not like bringing you back a Jared Kelnick prospect when he was younger or something like that. You know, that just doesn't happen per se, unless the team is super desperate. So gotcha. I thought it was about reasonable. I mean, I'm not a prospect guy and, you know, it's funny as we, we, everybody sits there and grades these trades. Like, we don't know. I mean, like, yeah, you're grading it based on what you see now, but like, do we really know what these guys are going to be or not? What if Paul's terrible for him? What if he's terrible for him next year? You know, look at Kess, you know, it's like the Abraham Toro had one hot month and it was, like, oh, Mariners won the trade. Did they? Did they really win the trade? I mean, Graveman and Montero that year, the Astros played in the World Series. The Mariners were watching the World Series at home. You know, they didn't win it, but they were there. Montero State helped them win the World Series the next year. I think the Astros won the trade. You know, Toro's gone. What was he? Negative war player for him. He had a nice couple months. He had a couple hits. He's a nice guy, but just wasn't an everyday guy. Um, yeah, I just think that it was about requisite with, with what I thought. I didn't think they were going to get a whole lot for Paul. I thought they'd get something, but I think they just decided it was better to get something that could help them at the MLB level this year and next year right away than to get a more of a lottery ticket type of guy that hadn't been above double a. Yeah. I guess with that, do you think they got more than you thought they would have gotten or is it just a wait and see type thing? I think it's more volume, you know, than it is the, you know, maybe you get two guys, but maybe the other guys a little bit higher on the prospect rankings or something like that, but not you know, the volume, you know, it sounded like, from where they wanted Rojas and they weren't going to give in and they finally got him to push Rojas in. I mean, like, you know, in like, um, in a purely statistical way, Josh Rojas doesn't look that valuable, but to a team because he can play all these different positions because he's kind of a good dude in the clubhouse because he, you know, has some ability to run the bases. He's valuable to a team that maybe doesn't always measure up statistically. But, yeah, I mean, like, I thought it was, you know, nothing like I never looked at it and said, oh, man, they they won or they lost it. I mean, trades are usually made so both sides address a need. It's like that's the difference. Like, I think Jerry understands that a little bit more. Like, Jack Z, because of the first trade he made ever as a GM, and it was Franklin Gutierrez and that crazy nine-player trade, he always wanted to win every trade. So, like, the trade would be at the deadline or the finish line, and then he'd ask for a sweetener. Oh, like I need one more guy or I need this guy instead of this guy. You know, he always wanted to make sure it looked like he came out on top. Well, that's not what trades are for. You're not trying to win the trade, You're trying to make your team better. It's not about, you know, whether somebody from the athletic or bleacher report or from the Seattle times thinks that you won the trade. It's whether or not those players help you to win games moving forward. Right. And, and going into kind of the, you know, it's hard to tell that you know who wins right now you got rojas for another three and a half years you got canzone for six years then you got ryan bliss who's now in triple a we'll see if he can help out at second base maybe maybe as soon as next year um well yeah like what what they got is players that have minor league options that are have big league time like that's what they don't have that's why they had to go get those guys is because like you look at triple a and what they have at AAA, yeah, you have Haggerty there, and, and I think we'll see him here eventually soon. But, like, you have Haggerty and Zach Deloach and, and Jake Shiner. They're nice players, but, again, like, they don't have that big-time prospect. There's no Kyle Lewis sitting at AAA when he was a prospect or Jared Kalnick when he was there or even, you know, Julio's a AA. But they don't have, like, a – they don't have, like, they're one of their top five position player prospects sitting at triple a just waiting to be called up like when when adam jones was at triple a raking 
and you know and they brought him up a few different times in 2007 you knew it was because you know, he's going to be here eventually but he can help us now you know it was like whatever the Mariners don't have those guys and that's you know Ken Zone and Rojas and all these guys they represent a little bit better quality of player with some big league experience at that kind of age grouping you know Jerry calls it waves or whatever but that kind of 25 25 24 to 27 year old age that you can use and and help you out I mean like they're not it's not a sexy trade by any means but it helps them and makes them a little deeper and it you know they don't have those guys really to help them out right now. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm curious with some of the other trades that might've fallen through kind of what you've heard on those, both with uh Tasker Hernandez. We heard that Ty France was on the trade block, which was news to me, which would be kind of be a sell low with him. Um, and then also, you know, there, there was the rumors of the young starting pitching, whatever that is that didn't transpire either. Um, what did you hear on some of the other trades that were in the talks? Um, yeah, like, you know, I like the thing with Ty was like a team because Jerry and you've heard it, you were there. I mean, like they listen on anybody. So if a team calls, Hey, I want to talk to you about Ty Francis. Okay. What do you got? You know, here's what we've got. Here's what we think he's worth. And, you know, they'll go, but once one team hears that Ty France, you know, the Mariners had a conversation about possibly (laughs) trading Ty France then everybody comes in, you know, it's like, yeah. Um, and so I think same with like with the the Cardinals, like the the young starting pitching, there's the people in the Mariners felt like, yeah, you know, because Jerry listens or whatever, and the Cardinals call them young starters, they're like, Yeah, we're not really that interested. If we if we did, we'd want Nolan Gorman or you know, um Jordan, what's his name? What's his, the other position player? Jordan, oh god, I'm blinking. Are you talking uh, Jordan Walker? Yeah, Jordan Walker. Yeah, we'll take one of them, you know. So right. it's like uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna ask for one of our best, we're gonna take one of your best, you know, it was one of those things. And that got shut down, but then like the Cardinals leak it to appease their fans, like, Oh yeah, we we looked at Logan Gilbert, we called on Logan Gilbert, you know. So it's yeah. like it's the it's sending out the message that you tried. I mean, like the Mariners do it too. Um, I don't think that they were that serious about dealing a starter now. Do I think that they'll entertain it again in the offseason? Absolutely, because they have a hard time getting position players and they have holes. They can get a they can get position players or a really good position player to fill right field or second base by trading Logan Gilbert or Bryce Miller in the offseason. And then what happens is what maybe you just go sign Blake Blake Snell or one of the starting pitchers. They've proven that they can get a starting pitcher to come to seattle they can't get a free agent hitter so maybe that's the avenue they have to take you know the whole yeah. draft develop trade whatever you can only do what you can do so if you know you can sign starting pitching then you trade the starting pitching because you have a surplus and go get a hitter that way um the Teoscar thing is weird like they shopped him they listened i mean they were gonna listen you know i don't i mean like what he's giving them now in the last few weeks it's like yeah we can piece that together. Uh, they didn't like the the offers back, but you know, that's talking to some other people around um, around baseball. Like the Mariners felt like everybody was lowballing him, and the other teams felt like the Mariners had an unrealistic idea of who Teoscar Hernandez is right now in the moment because he's not very good defensively, and he hasn't been hitting well. So. You know, I guess in their mind, they'd rather keep him, offer the qualifying offer, which they believe he'll turn down and then get the draft pick, which, you know, yeah. may be worth it. But, you know, I don't I don't think that I don't know, man, like it's 19 million, maybe 19 and a half, I think is what they're projecting the qualifying offer, maybe right. even 20. Maybe D- Teo does take it, you know, but I think my from everything I've heard is the Mariners believe he won't take it and that he'll go out in the free agent market because it's such a bad free agent class for hitters. So, I mean, that's, that's the thing is like people are asking for rentals, like who's out there? Like, you know, what are you getting? You know, give me names and show me like, Oh yeah, they could have got this, this or this, especially for two months. You know, when I, when I think we both know that like the problems, like you look like Josh Bell, I saw I got traded. Okay. You had Josh Bell. What does he really give you? Like, 
you can have Josh Bell, but if Julio doesn't hit and Suarez or Teo doesn't hit, he's just a big dude with dreads that's hitting in the middle of your order. Same with like Jake Berger strikes out at a rate similar to everybody on the Mariners. Does he really fit? Like, I, I guess there wasn't that bat that could change them. I don't know that they're a team that one bat changes them anyways, but one bat could help. But I didn't see like a bat out there that was like, oh, this is great. You know, this is what we really need. Hell, I think like Seth Brown is a better hitter than than Josh Bell or, you know, Jake Berger. If you use Seth Brown right when he's healthy, of course, because he's not healthy very much. But when you use him right, you use him against right handers and he's able to play. He's a better hitter than a lot of those guys. A couple other names, you know, that might have helped CJ Crone and also Randall Grichik uh, from the Rockies. Uh, they both went to the Angels in, in division. Um, I think those were the big ones. There was also uh, Mark Canna was tied to the Mariners, of course. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think they, they talked on Canna and they talked on Candelario because those guys were fits. Don't get, like, they, but they're, like, the thing is, is, like, you're asking for two months. Does two months of Jammer Candelario push you over the top? Like, if you got Canna, Candelario, you got, like, three of those guys, yeah, maybe that changes your your path, but I don't look at those guys and say, oh, yeah, man, that makes them so much better. Like, they're, they're in because, like, there's they were so flawed for the first 100 games. Like, you you know, you really want them to believe, like, oh, yeah, he's so much better on this. You know, they're, they're so much better based on the last – 10 games i don't think that's realistic but i mean that's kind of what they have to do um no i didn't like i never thought they were going to add a ton i thought maybe they they pick up a peripheral bat but if the prices were too high and they didn't want to do it then you know that's their fault the fault isn't the philosophy at the trade deadline the fault is the performance from a team that had flaws for the first 100 games you know like they didn't do enough in the offseason per se they've admitted it you know and even like the guys they did like pollock they never used him the way they expected to use him and they didn't face enough left-handers to get him in any sort of role like jared played well enough they didn't want to you know platoon him and so then pollock just rotted there they never used him enough like it wasn't there was some flaws to their roster design in the first place and then you know players performance also changed how the roster was but like if if Julio has the same first hundred games that he has last year, do I think they're in this position they're in now? No, I think they're probably three or four games better than what they were. Same with Suarez or same with Ty, but Julio's the aircraft carrier. If Julio's the same as he was last year, even with a bad April, but that hot of a June and July going into the deadline. Yeah. They're in a way different place, but he wasn't. And that's why they're there. And he, yeah, Julio could absolutely turn it on, you know, today, tomorrow, and that the team changes that that quickly. Um, and then also, I heard that the Mariners weren't wanting to trade any prospects at the deadline. Is that also true? I mean, like, they're not. They don't want to trade prospects for crap, you know. Like, right? If Jerry, like Depoto, and I've had multiple executives tell me this, they will listen on anybody. They'll tell you right off the bat, like, hey, we're we're not really interested in trading Julio, but if you want to ask about him, what's your offer? We'll listen. We'll debate it. Here's where we're at. Where do you think you're at? You know, they'll have the discussion on anybody. They will. It's like opposing uh, execs have told me that. They will talk about anybody. They'll let you know right away that maybe it's not going to happen. But, like, do you honestly think that Jerry DePoto is not going to say, we're not trading any prospects? No, right, what right. he's saying is I'm not trading Cole Young for two months of Jammer Candelario, you know? Right. And all these other teams are going to ask high because they think the Mariners are desperate, which in some ways they are, but they aren't. So it's like, yeah, we'll ask for this. Maybe they'll give it to us. Maybe they'll be dumb enough or desperate enough to give it to us. You know, I, I think you have to be reasonable. You have to have standards about what you're willing to give up and what you're willing or what you need. And again, also be realistic to the fact, like, I'm sorry, but, you know, the first 100 games versus the last, you know, what we saw the first 100 versus what we've seen the last week, you know, it's okay to be colored more by the first 100 than what you've seen the last week to say, oh, yeah, I don't really know if I believe in these guys. And I don't want to give away Cole Young or Gabby Gonzalez 
for the hope that maybe one bat might get us to the third wild card where we have to go on the road, which they were last year and they did well. And I mean, I believe too, like if they get in the postseason, it'd be good, but that's a lot of risk. You know, they needed the, the, the fault isn't in the thinking at the deadline. The fault is in the thinking in the off season and the performance during the season. That's, that's what led you to the decisions you made now. And it's not that they don't believe so much as that they've never been a given a reason to believe, you know, like, why would you, why would you believe that they're all of a sudden going to get on this hot streak? They bet they played better, but to totally mortgage your future and then hope to get in, you know, go past four teams. I mean, it's possible. And, you know, they'll probably do it because I'm sitting here saying they won't, but that's a difficult thing to do. And it's a lot like 2021. I mean, this, there's so many things that mirror 2021 that, you know, that it, and they didn't make it. If you recall, they didn't just miss by one. They missed by two. Everybody says it's one. They missed by two. And they, you know, that was only to get into the, um, that wasn't even in the postseason. That was to get into a play in game. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and just looking at this market, there wasn't really that many bats that were even moved beyond those names that we already mentioned. You know, Josh Bell was moved from the uh, to the Marlins for Khalil Watson, who is a former, you know, top prospect for the Marlins. He's having a down year, but a majority of the the people that were moved were arms. And you know, the Rangers continue to just stack up on arms. They got Aroldis Chapman, they got Max Scherzer, Jordan Montgomery. How do you how do you view the rest of the AL West now after the deadline compared to before? Well, it's a lot older now. I know that. Um, <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, like those guys had to make those moves because they did, they legitimately didn't have players to fill out their rotation. You know, it was like Texas was banged up. They didn't have enough to carry. You know, the the Astros too. Like they're they're you know McCullers isn't coming back, and um, they have guys that are on the IL. They have guys that are reaching innings limits that you know guys are dinged up like until he threw the no hitter framber was terrible coming out of the break it's like they needed to address these 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 aspects where it's like gotta go get it gotta go get it it's like uh in 21 when the mariners you know they were running a six-man rotation and then they had two spots missing and they had to go get tyler anderson it was big you know it's they had to do it there was no other trade you could make so um yeah, I, I mean, like, I think I think the Astros will still win the division. I think they passed them today, but I think they're going to win it anyways. Um, Texas is interesting. Corey Seager's back now. That makes a big difference. We'll see how those two pitchers, you know, like, you know, I don't make a lot of judgments based on how it's going to be after the first time through, but a couple times through. But it's it's better than a, a quad A guy going into the rotation. You know, Montgomery and Scherzer, obviously – have track record and they can be really good. And, you know, with that offense, they don't have to be great. They just have to be good, you know, be better than what they had in there. And that's going to help them. Same with like Verlander. You don't need him to be Cy Young Verlander. You need him to be better than Brandon Belak and the guys that they're having to use. And the thing about those two guys is they're such great competitors that they'll rise to the occasion. They will. You know, the, the thing is whether they'll still he- stay healthy the rest of the time. Um, I think, yeah, I think it'll end up being Houston winning the division, though. Yeah. And I think it was uh, this last week on Seattle Sports 710, Jerry DePoto was talking about, you know, the strength of the pitching staff that we have. Um, currently, Fangrass wins above replacement. And Seattle ranks fourth overall in baseball. At one point in time, they were the best overall. But DePoto said, you know, if, if we get into the postseason – the pitching can carry them through the postseason because you never know what could happen. Um, so to be in that, in such a position to where the the pitching staff is so young and elite that might give an advantage really over the other teams where, as, as you see during the trade deadline, they're having to stock up whatever arms they can get. Um, they, and, and, and I mean, the angels traded for Lucas Giolito and they go out and lose their first two starts with him on the mound. So. Well, it's like, I mean, like, for a wild card, you're getting three games. You're getting three games if you can line it up. The American, if you line it up for three games, the Mariners are going to run Castillo, Kirby, and Gilbert. You know, with Bryce Miller coming out of the pen, you tell Bryce Miller, yeah, you tell Bryce Miller coming out of the pen, hey, 
you only have to pitch two innings, empty the tank in two innings. He's going to be, you know, he's not going to be, you know, the, the fastballs that are 91, 92, because, you know, maybe he doesn't throw it with full conviction. They're just saying throw it as hard as you can for two innings, you know? That's upper nineties with yeah. elite spin rate. Yeah, that's it's a different animal. Like that's yeah, that it's it's fair to think that. But you know what? It's also fair to criticize them for saying, Hey, you know what? If if you're so good and you knew your pitching was gonna be so good in a postseason series, then do more with your offense, do more with your roster. And I don't think it's a Jerry thing as much as it's he's working within the parameters of what they're willing to spend or willing to green light. I don't think there is – I think they can spend more. I think, obviously, they can spend more. They just don't – they don't like the risk of it all. They're risk-averse, and so they haven't, and that's their problem. I, You know, I don't – like people sit there and say, oh, you know – I'm not one of those people, too, that sits there and says, oh, well, you got GDP, but look at how bad Trey Turner is or this or that. Like, I never thought any of those shortstops were real possibilities. I never thought – like, I never thought Correa was – there's just there's a disconnect there of her like not really interested in Seattle. Seattle's not really interested in him. Um, you know, maybe if once he found out he was hurt or whatever, but like Turner was never gonna stay on the West Coast. We saw that. I mean, like, I don't know about you, but to give up an extra forty million dollars and live in Philadelphia versus San Diego, what the hell? Like what the hell is that? <laughs> um Bogarts was the interesting one. I think they, you know, but you know, we got 11 years. I mean, like somebody jumped the market and overpaid the market. So I never thought that that was like, you know, a realistic fit. I thought there was some weird, you know, they could have addressed the DH, you know, do they go sign Conforto? Do they, they try and just add some bats or outfield DH types or a first base DH type go there. Yeah. They didn't love the prices that you were going to have to pay, but nobody does. You know, I don't like paying for gas at four freaking whatever it is, but I got to have it. I need it to get there. They needed more and they weren't willing to pay the cost of what it was. You know, they weren't willing to pay for the cost of gas. They'd rather walk than drive. And that's just stupid because it wasn't that much more. You know, you, you're ostensibly paying AJ Pollock's full, was it 7 million this year and 10 million to Colton Wong? And they're going to, what do they give you? You know, they didn't have to pay for <laughs> Listella. He was a free player essentially other than the minimum. You know, flexing, they pay for half, but like you have to pay for something. And sometimes like paying for the band aid is pretty stupid when you pay a little bit more for stitches and it's, you know, it's healed. That's the problem. They didn't do that. They didn't want to pay the extra to get some of these guys. And granted, like guys don't want to come here. Right? It's they just don't. Hitters don't believe you should can hit here. And, so, and, and part of me, you know, the Marine, the Marine layer that, that they have in Seattle. Part of me questions that because it seems that teams that come to Seattle and face the Mariners don't have that same problem that Mariners oh, yeah. hitters, hitters have. So I'm curious what's up with that. Well, I mean, like it doesn't get in their heads and they're not playing there all the time. But some of the guys that hit here, they hit everywhere and they hit them really, really far. What, <laughs> what hurt the Mariners is like, yeah, it didn't bother Nelson Cruz. Yeah. And it didn't really bother Cano after a while, but like, you know, it's, and it just, it's also dependent on the weather and everything else, but it's not even about, it's, you can sit there and show a player the park factors and you can try and explain the science to them and everything else. But if their friend says it's a sh shitty place to hit, then they believe it. You know, like that matters more to them than the science of it all. You know, or if an agent says, Hey, you know what? Don't go there on a pillow contract because you're not going to put up numbers. They're going to believe them. You know, that's the difference. And so, you know, throwing the travel, everything else. I, they'll, You can get a hitter to come here. Absolutely. You just have to pay a lot more. You know, and that's something they haven't been willing to do. And so until they are, or until, you know, until they are, until the perception changes, it's going to be that way. Do you think realistically they can get a uh, pitcher slash hitter to come? I mean, they have as good a chance as anybody. Nobody really knows what that guy's thinking. Yeah. You know, they know that he'd prefer to stay on the West Coast and they know that he would prefer to have opt-outs and he doesn't want to be stuck to one team if the team's going to be terrible after seeing what happened to Trout. Um, they know that he wants certain comfort levels. He wants his specific interpreter. He wants his specific masseuse, all the stuff that he uses to get ready. And he wants teams to 
be amenable to doing all the things he has to do. The, I'm sure the Mariners are willing to do that, you know, and, and I, again, it might not be, you know, he might not be looking for the 10 year, 600 million when he's perfectly happy to get the eight year, you know, eight years at 50, 400 million, but with the ability to leave after two years, you should absolutely give him that option. If you give him the eight years at 50 million or even 60 million, 480 million over eight years, give it to him and say, okay, we'll let you opt out after the second year, the third year, the fourth year, and the fifth year every year, you know, and then at six, seven and eight, you should have the ability to opt out, you know, whatever, but give them, we'll say, look, we'll give you the ability to opt out, but you're going to stay here for two years. And in two years, we're going to win the world series. And then we hope you'll stay, but we'll give you the ability to opt out in two years. Like if this, you don't like where it's going in two years, you can leave. Cause then what are you out? I mean, you don't pay any more money to an unhappy player that doesn't want to be there. That's what you have to do. You have to provide him freedom and control of his situation, you know, and then also make sure that all the other amenities he likes are there. If you can do that, you have a chance. It's not going to be whoever gives him 750 million. I don't think that's everybody I've talked to says that's not the case. He makes plenty of money as it is. It's about where does he feel comfortable? How does he manage his routine? You know, all those things. Yeah, because at what point is the dollar figure, you know, to a point where it doesn't even matter at that point? It's like, what are the what are the conditions that you're going to be playing in and living in for those those years that matters more? Yep. Um, all right. So let's get to a few of the questions that some of the people that are watching this have asked. Okay. So we'll just start from the top. So if Ryan was king of the world in running the Mariners, what would you have done this year and why? Like, how, like, how do they mean, though? Um, I would assume from the start, so like in the off season, uh, it, you know, instead of you know bringing in Wong, Pollock, um, Listella, who would he, who would you have brought in this off season? Huh. And we we mentioned some of those names. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know, because I probably like from you got to remember, I love Hanniger because me and him are boys. <laughs> you know, I've covered him forever. Um, huh. I probably would have addressed the outfield differently. Um, I understood the trade for Teo, but you're paying him, like, I think, I don't know, I think it's 10 or something or 12. Like, you know, maybe do something with Hanniger in that way because it meant more. You know, you can't sit there and say he was going to break his forearm if he was there, but he probably got dinged up maybe. But, like, the leadership aspect he provided. But then I also would have went out and got somebody like Conforto or somebody like that, or a bat like that, that could have sat at the DH a little bit more. Yeah. I I understand why you want to rotate your DH, but there's ways to rotate your DH without having Dylan Moore and Tommy Listella and those guys there. That makes more sense. Um, I think I didn't, yeah, I didn't love the hitting. Like I didn't love the hitting market after the shortstops. Like it wasn't great. So um yeah that's probably the one the few things i would have done um yeah yeah colin wong thing i probably also like because it meant but he might not want to stay either but because it, you... looks like we lost ryan for a second we'll see if he comes back uh if you guys have more questions for ryan feel free to drop them. oh there he is you're yeah, back. sorry. Um, yep. I would have probably brought in Colton or Adam Frazier back. <laughs> yep. Ryan was saying that he would have. Oh. Are you there? Yeah, we're there. Uh, yeah. I heard Adam I Frazier. Would, yeah, I probably would have just brought Frazier back or somebody like that. I mean, there were some other second basemen. Maybe you, maybe you try and get some other guys and, um, um, and that kind of stuff. And so I don't know. I didn't. I didn't love that market. You know. I guess you could have tried for some other guys, but um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I have my girlfriend calling me. Oh, no so worries. Message her. If you need to step off or. No, we'll go for a few off. more minutes, and I'll take okay. a couple more. I talk forever, so I'm sorry. No worries. No, the more the better. Um, <laughs> so another one is thoughts on Ty France's year and his future with the M's. That's not been good. Uh, he's got to readdress some physical issues. I just think he's 
he's carried carrying a little too much weight. He lost some weight in the offseason. I think he's put it back on really quick. I think that's affected him. Um, just flexibility and other stuff. Getting older, it's harder to be that way. I don't know what his future is, but I mean, if they're willing to listen to offers on him now, they're going to be willing to listen to offers on him this offseason. So, like, if you make a trade, maybe he's packaged in it. You know, like sometimes they, a team will trade like a, a top level star player or something like that, or a big player, you have to get major league players in return. Ty fits that bill. You know, he's a good player, but what is he? Is he at 260 or is he at, I don't think he's a 320 hitter. So, you know, you hope that he's closer to 290 than 270 because there's not a lot of power there. Yeah. Um, another question. Um, not tra- trade related, but what are your thoughts on why the Mariners seemingly cannot develop MLB hitters? And I kind of disagree with the question, but I'll let you respond first. I think it's harder to develop hitters than ever before. Yeah, the Mariners have like Julio, and and part of it is like the reason they haven't you don't see any developmental guys from their system is because they're most of the guys they have on their team aren't from their system. You know, they they make trades, they acquire them in different ways, like who on their team is from their system that came up all the way through their system draft and developed and everything like that. It's like Julio and Cal, you know, um, do they think there has been times where they rush guys? Yeah. They rushed Jared a little bit. Absolutely. They didn't. If they say they didn't, they're lying. Um, I think it's harder now, but you know, you look at the Tampa Bay Rays. I don't know that any of those guys that are on their team right now were drafted and developed by them. Paredes, um, Diaz, Yandy Diaz, Jose Siri was on this team, Randy Rosarena, they were all other guys. You know, you try and get guys that are close to the finished and then you finish them. You know, Mitch Hanniger wasn't through the system. I mean, like the last guy that I can think, position player that was drafted and developed was Kyle Seeger, but there have been other guys. And again, like, what do they develop into? Sometimes these guys' windows or the their projection levels aren't to be Kyle Seager. They're just to be a, an average major league player. And I think people don't realize what a win that is for development. It's a win to draft a player and have him get to the big leagues. That's considered a win, especially any round after fifth. Speaking of, of that, you got Cade Marlowe, who was drafted by the Mariners in the 20th round, who is now up on the big leagues. And he's been impressive so far from the at-bats that I've seen. Yeah, he's been great. I, I like his maturity. He's very he's an older guy anyways, you know, senior sign, um COVID year and everything else. So he's a little older. He don't get, he don't get really sped up when he plays. And if you look at him, if you ever talk to him, he's super chill. I know I, I heard he does some meditation and all this stuff, but like that's a big thing. If you can keep the game, if it feels slowed down to you, the game doesn't feel fast. That's a good way to be. And right now it doesn't feel fast. So we'll see when they adjust. They'll get a scouting report on him and he'll have to adjust back. But right now he looks pretty good. On Cade, uh, another question. Who is more jacked, uh, Cade Marlowe or Jared Kelnick? Because I, I saw Cade Marlowe in person and he looks he looks huge. Yeah, Cade's <laughs> big. Like Jared is ripped. Cade, Cade is probably bigger, like across the chest, you know, like like broader shoulders yeah. he's a little taller too but jared is pretty cut i mean like there's you know jared jared works out a lot he he he's quite proud of the working out yeah um just to follow up on that question um one other hitter that i would bring up would be noel b Marte. he's about to make his debut at some point for the reds and he came through the mariner system so that's another hitter that they developed for the most part yeah it'll be interesting to see how far he goes i mean like I think the Reds will probably trade him this off season when they have to try and get pitching. I thought they might try and trade him this season to get pitching because, you know, they have a ton of infielders anyways, but yeah, they may have to trade him because they need pitching and they don't have any coming. Another question. Um, did you ever get Goldie for that time? Goldie got you on TV with your, your glasses or when you're eating ice cream on air. No, they were doing that ad for the Seattle Times. I will get him some point. I have some ideas, but <laughs> you know, yeah, he's I'll get him back. Believe me. Okay. Um, let's see here. Oh, this this has been a, 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 a 
I've gotten this a couple of times. They're asking on if the extra innings podcast is going to be coming back with you and Larry Stone. Well, we did one a little bit ago, so we're going to do one maybe tomorrow or maybe Friday. So we'll try and do it one of those days. Adam Jude has been in Southern California all week with his daughter. And then we were going to wait till after the, um, the uh, trade deadline, but um, I'm going to Montana tomorrow because Adam's covering the series in Anaheim because he's already there. So either tomorrow morning or then either we'll record it Friday morning when I have some time Friday morning. Awesome. And then final question, um, what do you think the Mariners are going to do to cover uh, Brian Wu's limitations, potentially uh, Bryce Miller's um, innings limits this year? Will Hancock be coming up? Will they do a six-man? Will they just skip some starts for Brian Wu? I think they're going to do a six man, but don't hold me to that. They're going to announce it next week. The six so guy is Hancock. Yeah, I think so. Cause he's pitched pretty well. So we can give it a try and they could put Trent Thornton in that six guy right now. But I think because they're saying they're going to make this adjustment this early. Um, I think that it it's probably some variation of a six man rotation. It might not be a straight six because they have some off days and stuff coming up, but that's, what I think could happen or, you know, and, and in that situation too, it could be a one where Brian Wu goes out and makes a start for two innings and then they pull him ostensibly turning it into a bullpen start, but having yeah. him start it. So that's kind of what I think will happen. Cool. Well, Ryan really appreciate your time as always. Uh, yeah. Sorry I was late. We we're just hanging, you know, we're trying to solve the problems of the world of the Seattle times. So. No, all good. No need to, for, uh, to apologize. I really appreciate it. All right. Take it easy. Sorry. All so right. Have a good one. Yeah, see ya. See ya. All right, that's Ryan Divish. Uh, thank you for your guys' questions. I'll scroll down here and see what other questions there are to cover without him. Um, so we covered a mo- most of these here. This is this is the one that I wanted to get to. Um, so can you talk about the process of going from starting a YouTube channel to now being a part of the Mariners Media community? So... Yeah, I mean, first off, I would just say start creating content, you know, whatever, whatever you personally would want to watch, I would say if if you're trying to start a YouTube channel or to start a brand, whatever, just start creating content that you yourself would want to watch. And eventually people, you know, will want to watch the same type of content that you're creating. And then you don't have to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. You're never going to be perfect. Just start somewhere. Just start creating and then like they say, you know, in the Mariners clubhouse, you know, 1%, just get 1% better every day, learn or get 1% better each video that you make, learn one new th- editing tip or trick or anything, just make it each video better moving forward and you, you'll go from there. Regarding the actual, you know, Mariners credential stuff, you, you kind of do have to get connected to someone within the Mariners to actually get credentialed. So I got connected with someone within uh, the uh, communications department there. Um, But I mean, once you create a channel and have a certain amount of followers or a following of any type, then you can reach out to the Mariners and kind of explain yourself, introduce yourself, explain what you're doing, what you're trying to do, and they might give you that foot in the door. And all you need is that one opportunity. And so, yeah, I've just been running with it. You know, every weekend that the Mariners are up in Seattle, I've been driving up, you know, a few hours to go to the games and, you know, just have the opportunity to try to get player interviews on the sideline. And then also connecting with some of the people in media in the front office, like Ryan has been great up there. I met some other great people. And um, the goal for you guys that are on here, the goal this off season is to get um, as many players as I can, both from the Mariners and from other you know, teams on the, on the long form podcast and to just be able to sit down, ask questions and hear their stories. And then also my goal is to get Jerry DePoto, Justin Hollander, all those guys to just sit down and (laughs) I'll ask them questions and just see how it goes. And I'll make sure to ask you guys for lists of questions that you guys want to ask. Also, I'll try to be as nice as I can with them. (laughs) Um, but let's see here. This comment, thank you. I really appreciate it, Khalil. I appreciate that. Um, another comment was from Dilla. Uh, 
I am a Cug. I went to Washington State University over in Pullman. I did four years there, finance and marketing. Yeah, so I have a little uh, Cug helmet down on my case of sports that I got behind me. So go Cugs. Um, let's see here. Yeah, Divish in the, in the dark segment for sure. I should do more live streams. Uh, I'll try to for sure. I might try to do weekly because now I'm trying to do like a podcast a week. And so, you know, the more that I do live streams or podcasts, it takes away from the other types of content that I can create, you know, the other videos, because basically I'm doing this all in the evenings and weekends. I have a full-time job on top of this. And so I'm just doing it in the time that I have. But if you guys want more live streams and I can try to do more of those, maybe one a week for those one podcast. And then I can try to do videos in between D three R three Kish. Thank you for joining. Thanks for saying you enjoyed it. And I, I was fake name said great summary. So cool. Thank you. Appreciate that. I was thinking about doing a podcast where it's just myself kind of talking about my story and exactly how I got here because you know, that's, one thing is, um, I mean, everyone has their own story with how they got started. And um, some people, you know, went through sports or went through broadcasting school or went through whatever, but I have no background in video or editing or, um, I mean, I played sports growing up and all that type of stuff, but I've been in finance for seven years, nothing related with sports. And then I just started this as a side passion hobby thing. So maybe on the next podcast next week, I'll just kind of sit down and talk about my story and, and talk about that. Okay. It seems like there might be some Husky fans in here. So I'll just, uh, <clears throat> I'll leave you guys alone. <laughs> uh, what's my best advice for someone with 1700 subscribers to really push the channel to the next level. <clears throat> I mean, 1700 subscribers is, <clears throat> is a lot, um, considering, you know, I don't know how many, there's statistics out there on, you know, what percentage of YouTube channels have a certain amount of followers, but I mean, that's a great start. What I would, what, what I did that started to really help me was I, I delayed doing short form content for the longest time. I was putting off wanting to do TikTok or Instagram reels or any of the short stuff. I was just focusing on long form content, but then once I started doing short form content and really what I was doing was taking my long form videos. So like, for example, I make a player profile that's 10 minutes long, then you could chop that down into like multiple shorts and then post that sh same short across all the different channels, TikTok, Instagram reels, Facebook reels, YouTube shorts, and basically trying to, you know, direct all that traffic back to the YouTube channel. But so I would start, if you're not already, then start doing short form content and post it, post the same stuff across all the different channels because the algorithm on YouTube versus TikTok, Instagram, they're all different. So you'll see that, you know, one platform will take off versus another platform that same video won't do as well. So just post it across everywhere, see which platforms work and, but just the default should be like post too much then not enough and post it everywhere. Just, you never know where it'll get the views. I'll do a story podcast. I'll plan to do that, do that one next week. I'm going to turn this one that we, we did tonight into a podcast that'll go live tomorrow. Um, with Ryan Dibish talking about what we talked about today. Anyone else have any questions, comments, anything? Otherwise I'm going to wrap this up. But uh, just a quick recap. So tomorrow, the uh, the Mariners, let's see here. The Mariners start their, uh, I won't share that one. Tomorrow, the Mariners uh, start their four-game series against the Angels in Anaheim. It's going to be Brian Wu versus Shohei Otani. Um, so make sure to, to tune into that one. Jage Sports, my favorite Mariner. So uh, I have a few. I mean, Munoz, he's really cool. Him and I chat you know pretty much every time i'm up there he's been super nice and uh it turns out he's a subscriber so shout out to munoz if you're watching this but um yeah munoz um of course julio like justin topa is super nice um all the relievers have been super nice you know all of them are warming up in right field 
when I'm out there on the sidelines. So a majority of the people that I've been able to get are the relievers and they're all, they're all really nice guys. But yeah, I mean, there aren't really any guys that I don't like, you could say. So that's a good thing. I think the clubhouse, just the, just the, the setup of the roster, I think has a lot of great guys. I'm really hoping to get Josh Rojas, um, interview him. And then also, um, Ken zone. I really want to get him. So I actually asked the, the Mariners if I could regarding is the sideline sideline couch coming. Yeah. So I, I actually asked my connection, um, if I could bring an inflatable couch with me and a, uh, portable air pump with, you know, battery powered air pump so that, you know, they don't have to do anything. Just let me be able to bring my own stuff. And then I could just inflate a couch on the sideline. And that way I could be the couch GM on the couch interviewing players. And I think the players would have gotten a kick out of it, but apparently is vetoed by, uh, some of the people, um, but my argument is that, you know, ESPN, when they show up to a ballpark, they have a giant setup. They have a giant, you know, desk, all these lights, all this stuff taking up a big scene. I would just be taking up the same space that I'm already in right there. It would just be me bringing my own couch. So they said no this time, but I'm going to keep asking and eventually I'll be doing that for sure. All right. Well, thanks again for watching everyone and for commenting your questions, uh, your, your opinions. Um, make sure to tune into the series tomorrow. Uh, feel free to, you know, comment whatever podcasts you'd like me to do, any topics that you'd like me to cover, um, any player profiles that you'd like me to do. I feel like a can zone player profile is going to be coming at some point soon. He seems like a really interesting guy. So thanks again for watching and we'll see you next time.